Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. Every choice produces some kind of an effect in our life. And we need to use our free will to choose to do things that we know are right, but that we don't necessarily want to do. I think that we should always have great reverence and respect for the Word of God. And um, I love what the Amplified Bible says several times in Psalms that we should uh, hear the Word, receive the Word, love the Word, and obey the Word. So a lot of people hear it, but they don't receive it. And then maybe there's some who do receive it, but they don't love it enough to actually motivate them to do it. So let me just say up front that anytime you hear the word, you always need to have already made your mind up that you're going to receive some kind of instruction that's going to require some kind of action from you when you leave. You see, just because we underline stuff in the Bible and we color in it with markers, that's not what changes our life. Even hearing it is not what changes your life if we're not motivated to go then and by the grace of God do what we've heard. And the Word of God has power in it. I love that. There's inherent power in the Word to save our souls, according to James chapter 1. When you're born again, your spirit's in good shape after that. Jesus lives in you. He came and cleaned everything up inside. But it's our soul that we still have problem with. And our soul is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And tonight, I'm going to teach on the inner life. I think it's very important to get a fresh awareness that you have two lives. You've got an outer life and you've got an inner life. You have a life that everybody else sees, and then you have a life that's very private to you that only you and God see, although other people may see the results of your inner life, they don't actually see your inner life. Many times we're not even aware of what's going on in our inner life because we don't pay any attention or we don't really think that it matters. But I have one major goal tonight. And so let me just kind of start out by saying, what are you full of? For example, are you full of God or are you full of yourself? How much bitterness and resentment have you got rolling around in there? Good attitudes, bad attitudes. I want to tell you what, the inner man is a busy place. I mean, it is amazing what all is going on in there. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. But first, I want to spend some time establishing actually the reality of the inner life because I think we can go a long time in our life and some people probably never, ever, ever come to the understanding of how important their inner life is. And I just want to make it very clear tonight that your inner life is much more important than your outer life. Thank you. Wherever you're at, I'll preach to you. Our outer life is our reputation with people. But our inner life is our reputation in heaven. That's our reputation with God. As I like to say, you can dress it up and take it to church. You can hang jewelry on it. You can put makeup on it. Everything can match. You can plaster a smile on it. But that does not tell anybody anything about what's going on inside. You know as well as I do that you could look at somebody and say, well, praise the Lord, it's so good to see you and be thinking, I can't stand you. <laughs> and so it's not what I say to them that really matters, unless, of course, I'm very sincere. You know, one of the things that Jesus had a real problem with was hypocrites and phonies. Pretenders, 
the Bible calls them. And so we can put on a show for everybody, but God knows. Amen? And if you really want to enjoy your life, which I'm pretty sure that you do, if you really want to enjoy your life and you want to have peace and you want to be healthy and you want to have energy, then the inner life has to be right. Because I can tell you the truth, many people who are exhausted by the end of the day, they're not tired from what they physically did that day. <laughs> they're tired from what went on inside all day. Amen. Amen. And I actually was a Christian for a long, long time before I really ever became aware that what was going on in me really mattered at all. I think like a lot of people, I just thought, well, as long as nobody knows or as long as I can control it, then it's not a problem. But we know that Jesus said that, that if a man looks on a woman to lust after her, that he has already committed adultery as far as his heart is concerned. So really, our thought life, our attitudes, the things that go on inside of us really are much, much, much more important than the things that go on around us. Do you know that if you study the prayers of the Apostle Paul, and this, this amazed me when I saw it and amazes me every time I talk about it. You can never find one place in the prayers that Paul prayed for the church in Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, where he prayed for their problems to go away. He never one time prayed that their problems would go away, that they wouldn't have problems, that their trials and tribulations would go away. What Paul always prayed was that they would be able to endure whatever came with good temper. And so let me just suggest this to you. Our attitude toward our problem is much more important than the discomfort we get from the problem. Our attitude toward our problem <laughs> is much more important than how we feel about the problem. Or let's try another one. How we behave towards somebody who's maybe not treating us all that great <laughs> is much more important than the un discomfort we feel from how they're treating us. <laughs> See, you're going to yell now, so I go on to something else. You don't have to hear any more of that, right? Because see, here's what happens. And the book of James really clarifies this. You know, people always cringe when you start reading James 1, be exceedingly joyful in all kinds of trials and tribulations, knowing the time your faith brings out patience. Everybody's just like, oh. <laughs> I have to hear that again. But really, now listen to me, nothing reveals who we truly are. Not the us that we show everybody, but Nothing reveals who we truly are like a good season of trials. <laughs> so therefore, the apostle Peter said, why are you amazed at the fiery ordeal that is taking place to test your quality? <laughs> I don't know about you, but when when I buy something, I want to know what I'm getting. Nobody here has probably ever bought a mattress without laying on it. <laughs> Are you one of those people like me that you go to the mattress store and you lay down fully clothed on all the beds and just lay there? Have you ever bought a chair without sitting in it? Or bought a couch without sitting in it? No, we want to we want to kind of know what we're getting. And even though God knows everything, he walks with us through time as if he didn't. <laughs> and he wants to, so to speak, test our quality to see if we're going to hold up under that next level of promotion that we've been begging for. 
Because you see, every new level presents a new devil. So if you're not doing well on this level and you want to be promoted to a higher level, if you're not dealing with the devils here, you're not going to deal with the ones up here any better. You ever wonder why you pray for blessings and get trouble? <laughs> the blessings will come, but the test probably will come first. You still smiling, I hope? <laughs> All right. Now, I have probably 35 scriptures up here, which we're obviously not going to be able to get all through of them. But I do want us to look at quite a few scriptures tonight if you're okay with a good old-fashioned Bible study, okay? Because here's what I think. I think when we put them on the screens and you look at them or you open up in your Bible and you look at them, it's great for me to quote them to you, and I do them a lot, but it even has a different impact if you see it with your own eyes. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4 Verse 16, therefore we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless, exhausted, and wearied out through fear, though our outer man is progressively decaying and wasting away, yet our inner self is being progressively renewed day after day. So Paul apparently said, hey, I'm going through a lot of stuff. It's hard. I look at myself in the mirror. I can see that I'm aging. But you know what? I'm getting younger and younger on the inside every day. And let me just tell you a secret about the number of years that you've lived. Age is really a lot more than a combination of years. It's a lot more about attitude. And I can tell you that just because you get what the world would call old, that doesn't mean that you're useless and can't do anything. It doesn't mean that you're too old to start something new because honestly, you are never too old to start something new. If God puts something new on your heart, it's not too late for you. It's never too late to begin again. And I can tell you that if you keep a new attitude, if you keep a fresh vision, if you have something that you really want to live for and something you really want to put yourself into, you're not going to go around being so aware of how old you are. I mean, I honestly feel like that I'm younger now than I was when I was in my 40s, and it's because I have been constantly renewed through the Word. I have a better attitude now than when I was 40. My thoughts are a lot better now than when I was 40. I've got a lot, a lot more peace now than I did when I was 40. Therefore, my body's gotten older, but my heart has gotten younger, and so I actually feel better now than I did then. I have a goal tonight. I want you to leave here tonight knowing how important your inner life is. I think we need to dedicate our inner life to God. We're always dedicating, you know, I dedicate myself to you. Well, what part of you are you dedicating? <laughs> you know? <laughs> How about dedicating attitudes and thoughts and keeping a clean conscience before God? That would be a great thing to dedicate. And you know what? I mean, you can have a guilty conscience and have a heavy heart all the time and People may not know that. They know something's right, not right, but they don't really know what it is. How many of you think it's really good to take some time to just talk about our inner life and what's going on in there? You know, I talk all the time about we, you can have a bumper sticker on your car and a cross hanging around your neck, carry your Bible to work, and really, that, I mean, that doesn't mean anything. I mean, it honestly really doesn't mean anything. The Bible says you will know them by their fruit. So it's what comes out of us. It's what in us that comes out of us under pressure. And isn't, isn't it amazing how much different we can act at home sometimes than what we do when we're around somebody we want to impress? Oh, not, not you. You don't do that. Okay, well... Uh. I'll preach to these people that aren't back here then. <laughs> okay, now, Habakkuk tells us that 
when we're going through the most difficult times that we're actually growing spiritually, that they're really good times for us. So Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, though the fig tree does not blossom and there's no fruit on the vine, though the product of the olive fails and the field yields no food, and you know, we don't necessarily relate to all these things because it's not our culture today, but you can certainly translate this into your own situations. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there's no cattle in the stalls, maybe we could say like, you know, though I got laid off from my, from my job and my kid brought home his report card and it had four Fs on it and three Ds. <laughs> though the principal calls me once a week telling me that my child is unruly in school and you know, though I broke my toe and, you know, whatever, you know. Yet I will rejoice. I will exalt. Please notice there's two I wills in a very short sentence. He didn't say, I feel like rejoicing. I feel like praising. He said, I will rejoice. I will exalt in the victorious God of my salvation. I will, I will, I will. Have to use the free will that God gave you to choose to do things that you know will be good for you even though you don't feel like doing them. And that deserves being said again, so here it comes. God has given us free will. It's one of the greatest gifts we have, but one of the biggest responsibilities we have. Every choice produces some kind of an effect in our life. And we need to use our free will to choose to do things that we know are right, but that we don't necessarily want to do. You cannot live by feelings and ever have victory in your life. You just can't. And it's not that God doesn't understand our feelings and, and he'll sympathize with our feelings sometimes. Feelings can be very strong, but we, they, they're also very fickle. They, you can be one way one day and another way the next day. And so I love all the places in the Bible where it says, I will, I will, I will. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad. And let me just throw in here that the more that we use our free will to choose the things that God would have us choose, the easier it gets to do it. Now let's back, back to this scripture. So this guy's got every kind of problem that he could possibly have. And he said, yet I will rejoice. The Lord is my strength, my personal bravery, my invincible army. He makes my feet like hinds feet and he will make me to walk, not to stand still in terror. And if you don't know what, a, what the animal called the hind is, it's a, it's a certain kind of mountain goat that can jump on its back legs like unbelievable heights. And so you'll have a mountain going straight up that you think, how could anybody climb that? But this particular animal can jump on its hind legs and just go poop, 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 poop. And that's the way we need to be. Not afraid of the mountains, able to climb them. Now watch this. He makes my feet like hind's feet and will make me to walk, not to stand still in terror, but to walk and make spiritual progress upon my high places of trouble, suffering, and responsibility. Now, if I was to say to any believer, what, what are your highest places in life? <laughs> I certainly wouldn't get the answer, trouble, suffering, and responsibility. <laughs> that would not be the answer that I would get. People would, you know, when I get my way, when I feel, you know, feel wonderful, when the presence of God is all over me. But what he's saying here is not that God loves us having trouble. He doesn't. But when we have difficulty, which how many of you have difficulty from time to time? Okay. All right. So, you know, I've kind of found out that everybody does, so we might as well talk about it. There's really not much point in acting like if you have enough faith, you're never going to have a problem because that is just absolutely not true. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. Cheer up. I have overcome the world. I have deprived it of the power to harm you. 
See, we can go through things and come out actually better than we were when we went in because God will do that. Our trials work differently than trials in the world. If I keep a good attitude, and it only works if you keep a good attitude, if I keep a good attitude, I will actually grow spiritually during that hard time. And you know what happens when you grow spiritually? You could maybe have the same thing happen to you two months later and you wouldn't even hardly notice it because now you're stronger than you were when you went through it the first time. Come on, I want you to get this tonight. Just like you can condition your muscles, God conditions us, so to speak, to be able to get out in the world and actually face off with the devil and say, I'm not going to be defeated by anything you come up with. And it's, you know, it sounds hard, but it's not so hard the stronger your faith becomes. How many of you go through things right now that used to just wipe you out, put you in a fit of depression for a week, and now it doesn't bother you at all? That's what growing is, people. Amen? That is just what growing is. Revelation 3.17 says people can think they're rich and yet be poor. <laughs> so, it says, for you say I'm rich, I've prospered and grown wealthy, and I'm in need of nothing. Now, how many people in the world are like that? They've got money, they've got a nice job, they're climbing the ladder of success, they've got the right car, they live in the right neighborhood, they've got the right friends, and boy, they think they don't need God. I don't, I don't you know, I don't need anything. People that need that religion, that's just a crutch. I've got everything I need. And he says, but you don't realize, you don't understand that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Wow. I don't know about you, but I'm glad I know Jesus. Amen. Amen. And the good thing about God is if you put him first and you put your relationship with him first, the Bible says you seek first the kingdom and he'll add the things. It's nice to have the kingdom and some nice things, but it's terrible to have the things and be totally lost and not get to spend eternity with God. Amen? But the point is, no matter what else you have, and I'm saying this a lot for just our people watching by TV, no matter what else you have, you are pitiable, poor, blind, wretched, and naked if you don't have Christ in your life. You know, I think we might say that we have two lives, our inner life, and our outer life, the things that go on in us and the things that go on around us. Well, think about this. Our inner life is our reputation with God. Sometimes He's the only one besides us that knows what's going on in there. And our outer life is our reputation with people. Which one are you focused on? If you want to enjoy your life, your inner thoughts and attitudes need to be dedicated to God. Eh, lo hacía escondida de todo, pero yo con 13 años lo pillé. También escuchaba como a veces él le pegaba. Entonces, eh, si bien mi mamá siempre trató de mantener la familia como en secreto, esas cosas. Que no, que era fea, que, no, que nadie me pescaba que no había esperanza en mí, que mis manos eran feas, mi cara. Me miraba al espejo y lloraba. Dos veces traté de ahorcarme.
Well, at Hand of Hope, the outreach arm of Joyce Meyer Ministries, we are honored to work alongside Teen Challenge to help people break the chains of addiction and to see all that God has created them to be. Patricia and Norbert, would you begin by telling us about the need for a home like this here in Chile? Well, we have uh, the situation with uh, the women growing up in atmospheres where men abuse them. And through that abuse, women are turning to drugs like never before. The men beat them up, they turn them into slaves, they make them do the drug runs. And so they are afraid to, st to step out. They are afraid to go back to their families. It's a nine to 12 month program. We have a curriculum that gives them step-by-step -step discipleship in which they can grow in Christ. Once they're mature enough, they're reunited with their children. And when they live that dream of being free from drugs and being free from those things that cause them to turn to drugs, then they can be the mother that they need to be. Humana, you are such an important part of all of these women's stories because of the way that you play a huge role in their healing. What are some of the particular troubles that women are dealing with? La necesidad de amor, del abrazo familiar, del abrazo de alguien que te ama, lo que lo que buscan, lo que necesitan, lo que transforma. Porque mis manos eh, son instrumento de Dios. Y esta es mi familia. Ellas son mis hijas. Cuando supe que Él me perdonó, a pesar de que le hacía daño también a la gente al vender droga, eso me, me sentí súper porque alguien me amaba así como yo era. You said before that you couldn't even stand to look in a mirror because of how ugly you felt. What do you see now? Cuando estoy trabajando, mucha gente se acerca a mí y me dice, oh, esa sonrisa, usted tiene algo especial. A ver qué, es especial. Y una vez me detuve y miré al espejo, pero miré mis ojos. Y me dijo, yo hice esto. Y era mi rostro. What an amazing privilege to see the way that these women are blooming, the way that the beauty that God has put in them is now coming out so that they can see it. And when you help a woman, it flows over into her children, into her families, and it changes so many lives. That is what Project Girl is all about, sharing the beauty. And you can do that with us right here in Chile, as we've been talking about, and in many, many places all over the world. the Word of God teaches us that if we are willing to share what we have, God can multiply that and make it into a lot more than what we started with. So please share. Help ons om andere mensen te kunnen helpen. Bel ons 026 20 22 100 of ga naar joyce-meijer.nl slash partner. Elk gebed en elke donatie telt. Samen veranderen we de wereld. Iedere dag worden we door vele stemmen, gedachten en meningen overspoeld. Hoe kunnen we erachter komen wat God ons door bepaalde levensvragen en dagelijkse uitdagingen zeggen wil? Joyce Meyer legt in dit boek uit op welke verschillende manieren God met je kan communiceren. Bestel nu hoe je God stem kunt horen telefonisch op 026 20 22 100 of bezoek onze website joyce-meyer.nl.
Een vervuld leven komt niet uit de hemel vallen. Maar het is zeker mogelijk, zegt Joyce Meyer. En ze laat je graag zien hoe je dat kunt bereiken. Maak kennis met Joyce. Met haar levensverhaal, met haar tips voor het dagelijks leven, met haar boeken en alle andere impulsen die je kunnen leiden naar een vervuld leven. Bestel gratis de informatiebrochure en bel 026 20 22 100. Of ga naar joyce-meyer.nl slash brochure.